What would be my, how should I call it, spontaneous attitude towards the universe? It's a very dark one. The first one, the first thesis would have been a kind of total vanity. There is nothing, basically. I mean it quite literally. Like, ultimately, ultimately there are just some fragments, some vanishing things. If you look at the universe, it's one big void. But then how do things emerge? Here, I feel a kind of spontaneous affinity with quantum physics, where, you know, the idea there is that universe is a void, but a kind of a positively charged void. And then particular things appear when the balance of the void is disturbed. And I like this idea spontaneously very much, that the fact that it's not just nothing, things are out there. It means something went terribly wrong that what we call creation is a kind of a cosmic imbalance, cosmic catastrophe, that things exist by mistake. And I'm even ready to go to the end and to claim that the only way to counteract it is to assume the mistake and go to the end. And we have a name for this. It's called love. Isn't love precisely this kind of a cosmic imbalance? I was always disgusted with this notion of I love the world, universal love. I don't like the world. I don't know how I, I basically, I'm somewhere in between, I hate the world or I'm indifferent towards it. But the whole of reality, it's just it, it's stupid, it is out there, I don't care about it. Love for me is an extremely violent act. Love is not I love you all. Love means I pick out something and I, and it's, you know, it's again this structure of imbalance. Even if this something is just a small detail, a fragile individual person. I say, I love you more than anything else. In this quite formal sense, love is evil. about the strangeness of today's situation. 30, 40 years ago, we were still debating about what the future will be, communist, fascist, capitalist, whatever. Today, nobody even debates these issues. We all silently accept global capitalism is here to stay. Today, no one even debates these questions. We all accept that the capitalism global is here to stay. On the other hand, we are obsessed with cosmic catastrophes. The whole life on Earth disintegrating because of some virus, because of an asteroid hitting the Earth, and so on. So the paradox is that it's much easier to imagine the end of all life on Earth than a much more modest radical change in capitalism, which means that we should reinvent utopia, but in what sense? Es decir, que deberíamos reinventar la utopía. ¿Pero en qué sentido? There are two false meanings of, uto on, of utopia. Hay dos significados falsos del concepto de utopía. One is this old notion of imagining an ideal society which we know will never be realized. The other is the capitalist utopia in the sense of new and new perverse desires that you are not only allowed but even solicited to realize. The true utopia is when the situation is so without issue, without a way to resolve it within the coordinates of the possible that out of the pure urge of survival, you have to invent a new space. Utopia is not kind of a free imagination. Utopia is a matter of innermost urgency. You are forced to imagine it as the only way out. And this is what we need today. 
Entonces, nuevamente, destaco que la utopía es algo que uno se ve obligado a imaginar, uno se ve forzado a imaginarla y no es algo que surja libremente de una fantasía, sino que es un imperativo de la urgencia de una situación. I hope I wasn't too long. I thank you very much for your patience. Espero no haber extendido demasiado. Gracias por su paciencia. Another very short comment, if I can make. You know, you know why I applaud it. If you watch old documentary movies, you will see a big difference between a fascist and the Stalinist leaders. The fascist leader, when he is applauded, he just accepts it. Un líder fascista, cuando lo aplauden, simplemente acepta el aplauso, lo recibe. A Stalinist leader applauds himself. El Stalinista se aplaude a sí mismo. The message being, it's not at me, I'm just your tool, we are all just serving history. And this was my side. Y esta fue mi So we are on. Okay. The worst thing is to play this we are all humans game that some intellectuals like to play. You project a certain intellectual persona, cold thinker, whatever, but then you signal through small details, you know, but nonetheless, I'm basically like you. I like small pleasures of life. I'm human like you. I'm not human. I'm a monster, I claim. It's not that I have a mask of a theoretician and beneath I'm a war human person. I like chocolate cakes, I like this, I like that, and so on, which makes me human. It's, I rather prefer myself as somebody who, not to offend others, pretends place that he is human. You come in? Ah, it is, of course. Ha, 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 ha. It means, welcome to welfare, to socialist wealth. Good, honest guy. I put everything here. I love this. So that, uh, I mean, by everything, I mean, look, even here it is. You see, isn't it a crazy combination? You have this and then you have uh, the clothes are here. But it's not only clothes, it's more. It's also, it's also, how do you call it, covers, uh, sheets for the, for the, no, no, everything is here. Look, everything is here. Ah, yeah, here, haha, <laughs> isn't this nice, close to the kitchen? Here, uh, socks, underwear, this is all my stuff. And uh, basically, this is all my stuff, newspapers, journals. These are my books in foreign languages, two copies of each one. So this is strictly prohibited. It looks bad. It looks bad. I think they are lower there. This is because this is mostly new stuff. Oh, this is simply... Do you, do you keep everything? Uh, I am a narcissist here. Yes, I keep everything. So what what is this doing here? This should, this should go elsewhere. I'm sorry, I just... I want order. So this is there. This is not me. Okay. If you need the Melina stuff... Ah, yes, there are some of them here. Let's see what's here, because these are the big format thing. These are some really early Mladina from... Ah, this is from the dissident times, yes. Mid-80s, I started to write from time to time. For two years, some people even claimed that I was the most influential. But then, new political divisions start, and I was too combative, attacking everyone, and so on. This was me. This was my fame. I worked like crazy at that time, because I remember at that time I was writing in English my first books. I never wanted to endanger, not even minimally, the theory. Which is why I was never, never interested in any kind of political career, because it simply it takes time.
Mislim, da nam mora biti dovolj tega, da se nas dela krive tako, da se nam nalaga dolg prejšnjih generacij. Dovolj dolgo smo bili material, iz katerega so gnetli tu jasanje, najbolj to sanje partizanov ali njihovih žrtev. Dovolj nam mora biti vampirjev, ki živijo od tega, da nas delajo krive in ištirjujejo od nas tuje dolgove. In danes je, če ne končam poetično, mislim, en sam kov, lesen kov, skupaj s Česnom, ki bo pokončal vse vrste vampirjev. Liberalno-demokratična stranka. Hvala. Two days before the election, there was a big round table with all the candidates, 20 of them, I don't know how much. Samo, jaz bi ponovo tukaj črčelo paradox. Je najslabši vseh možnih sistemov, težavajo tem, da ni kot kaže izkustvo nobenega ostalega, ki bil boljš. A right wing, naiv good guy, but basically an idiot, made a fatal mistake which everybody remembered. Not even a mistake, a kindness. Namely, as usual, as you can imagine, I talked quite a lot, too much. And then this guy wanted to censor me friendly and turned to me, this was all live, big debate, Central TV, blah, blah. Te stvari, in kljub temu, da mi je kolega Žižek zelo simpatičen, gotov ima on najvišji inteligenčni kocijent tu med nami, o tem sem prepričan, vendar je pa on toliko tam zgovoril kot polovico te naše mize. No, to je uvod. Listen, we all know that your IQ is twice as all of us others combined. But nonetheless, could you let us a little bit to talk? But everybody remember that, you know. You see, even they admit that he is the bright guy and so on. I remember then, you know, after it was over when the lights went off, no? The cameras went off. All other candidates started to shout to this guy, like, are you idiot? Are you crazy? Because then I, I jumped up immediately and almost got elected. <laughs> When I first visited the States, I was shocked by your toilets here. Romanticism onwards. There was the idea of so-called European Trinity. Anglo-Saxon economy, French politics, German metaphysics, poetry, philosophy, as the basic, as to put it, spiritual stances of Europe. Sorry, that's it. French politics revolutionary. Shit should disappear as soon as possible. Anglo-Saxon, American, let's be pragmatic, blah, blah, blah. German metaphysic poetry inspection, you inspect, you reflect on your shit. So isn't it totally crazy that in a vulgar common phenomenon like that, you find, a certain, you find certain differences which you cannot truly account in any functional terms, but you have to evoke all this. I mean, you claim, okay, I'm out of ideology at the conference, post-ideological era, then you go to the toilet, produce shit, you are up to your shit, or how do you put it in ideology, no? believes what today? Oh, I think this is an interesting question. Much more complex than it may, than it may appear. The first myth to be abandoned, I think, is the idea that we live in a cynical era where nobody believes, no values, and so on, and that there was sometimes, there were sometimes more traditional where people still believed, relied of some substantial notion of belief, and so on, and so on. I think it's today that we believe more than ever. And as Fowler develops it in a nice, ironic way, the ultimate form of belief for him is deconstructionism. Why? Again, I'm going back to that question of quote marks, no? Like, look how it functions, deconstructionism, in its standard version already at the texture of style. Like, you cannot find one text of Derrida without, A, all of the quotation marks, and B, all of these rhetorical, rhetorical distanciations. Like, I don't know, to take an ironic example, if somebody like 
Judith Butler were to be asked, what is this? She would never have said, this is uh, a bottle of tea. She would have said something like, if we accept the, 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 the metaphysical notion of uh, language identifying clearly objects <laughs> and taking all this into account, then may we not, she likes to put it in this rhetorically, risk the hypothesis that in the conditions of our language game, this can be said to be uh, 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 a bottle of tea and so on and so on. So it's always this need to distantiate. It goes even for love, like nobody almost dares to say today, I love you. It has to be, as a poet would have put it, I love you or some kind of a distance. <laughs> but what's the problem here? The problem is that, uh, why this fear? Because I claim that when the ancients directly said, I love you, they meant exactly the same. All these distanciations were included. So it's we today who are afraid that if we were to put it directly, I love you, that it would mean too much. We believe in it. I learned in the high school. What? English and Russian. You know why Russian? What? It's so disgusting, the reasoning behind it. Because all my friends, most of my friends took either French or German as a second language. Mm -hmm. Okay, my idea was, you know, there was a cold war to superpowers. Isn't it good to, to play it safe? Whoever wins <laughs> will speak their language. <laughs> there were three levels of dissidents. The first, in theory. I mean, if you dealt with theory or whatever, or writings. The first level was where you allowed to teach. This was the first level of exclusion. The second level were, are you allowed to publish books? The third level was, are you allowed to get a job at all in your domain? And the fourth level is for score, you are arrested or whatever, no? I was between the second and third. My God, I was unemployed, it was humiliating. I had to, my, my parents, I was 27 and my parents supported me, my God. Then for two years, it was that humiliating job at the Central Committee. They knew that I am not an idiot and that I will probably succeed. So they were afraid that I would simply move abroad and succeed there. This would then be bad for, you know, another victim who wasn't allowed to make a career in Slovenia. So they want me to vegetate on the margin, but there in Slovenia. It was, in a way, an intelligent move. But they didn't know it that the way they did it, they make it even easier for me to move abroad. You. Okay. 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 But you don't. Don't you have? No. Yeah. Okay. I have. I have. Give. Give him seven. It's okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so. Okay. Gracias. Gracias. This is Disney. Yep. Ah, my God. I thought this would be some kind of old building, you know, with Peron and so Not Peron, with Borges and so on. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. I didn't like the way that guy looked at me, you know. It's already an idiot coming there. I hate this. Let's move there. I really hate this. What do you hate? I hate when I think that idiot, friendly prep person, recognized me. And I hate this because then they. It's terrible. It's they descend terrible. on you? Oh my god, okay. <laughs> to whom do I put it to? Flora. Thank you. Thank you. Did you ever expect this to have all these fans? No, but that's what I, I really hate this. I mean, I cannot tell you how much I hate it. You don't love it just a little bit? No, 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 no. I think people are easy. This is horrible. 
You see all these creeps, all these creeps here. This is horrible. Who is that hysterical woman? She's a fan, Slapwood. Yeah, but uh, I mean, what is she doing here? She should go up there and wait in line. I mean, not annoy me here. <laughs> Je dis toujours la vérité. Pas toute. Parce que toute la dire, on n'y arrive pas. La dire toute, c'est impossible matériellement, sans les mots qui y manquent. C'est même par cet impossible que la vérité touche au réel. Ici, on est à la télé. It was simply made as a documentary supposed to present the Kenyan theory to a white public, I think for the second uh, channel of the French state TV. J'y suppose. Analyste. L'inconscient, quel drôle de mot. Oui, je suis d'accord. What I appreciate is this inversion, reversal of the role between public image and private. It's mm -hmm. that uh, this total denigration, disappearance of this warm human person. This for me is the idea uh, of ideology. The central idea of ideology for me is not this idea as determining you are a Christian, you are a Marxist or whatever today, liberal, I don't know, but the idea is precisely that ideological propositions do not determine us totally. We cannot be reduced to our public image. There is a warm human being behind. I think this is ideology at its purest. The most horrible anti-ideological act for me, and really horrible, terrifying, is to, to fully identify with the ideological image. The ultimate act is what we think is our true self, that there is the true acting, and that usually our truth, to that to which we are really committed existentially, is in our acts more than in what is supposed to be uh, behind the act. So again, my point is that I'm, I like philosophy as an anonymous job, not as uh, kind of, look, the way he moves now and so on, these gestures. I, I find this ridiculous, he emphasizes. One cannot say the, all the truth. It's impossible materially. This ridiculous emphasis, I think it's a pure fake, an empty gesture, as if he makes a deep point there, he does not. I read Lacan in a very classical way. What interests me are his proposition, the underlying logic, not his style. His style is a total fake, I think. I try to forget it, I try to repress it. Maybe it works as a strategy, as a certain point, why not? First you have to seduce people with obscure statements, but I hate this kind of approach. I'm a total enlightenment person, I believe in clear statements and so on. And I'm for Lacan because, again, I think, to make it very clear, that it's not that Lacan is just bluffing, in the sense that there is nothing behind this obscurity. The whole point of my work is that you can translate Lacan into clear terms. Well, I just have enough of this. Now, live from the CN8 studios, this is CN8 Nightbeat with Barry Nolan. Jacques Lacan was a French psychoanalyst. He makes Freud sound like a simple valley girl. Lacan's theory of how the self works is so complicated, it makes my teeth hurt to think about it. Zlavaj Zizek 
is a philosopher at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. I think I said this fairly close to the way it's pronounced, who has written a book called The Puppet and the Dwarf. The book takes a modern takes a look at modern Christianity from the viewpoint of Lacanian psychoanalysis, or at least that's what I think it's about. Welcome, Mr. Zizek. Did I say it? Tell me the right way. Slavoj Zizek. But again, Zizek. But again, I prefer it the wrong way. It makes me paranoid if I hear it. This the is right the most way. complicated book I have ever tried to read. Strange, because the goal of the book is, on the contrary, to like make Lacan back into someone whom even your grandma could understand. Let's say you have a good old-fashioned father. It's Sunday afternoon. You have to visit grandma. The father, good old-fashioned authoritarian father, will tell you, listen, I don't care how you feel if you're a small kid, of course. Mm -hmm. I don't have, ha care how you feel. You have to go. You're gone. Yeah, go with grandmother and behave there properly. Okay. That's good. You can resist. Uh, no, nothing is broken. But let's say you have this so-called tolerant postmodern father. What he will tell you is the following. You know how much your grandmother loves you, but nonetheless, you should only visit her if you really want to. Now, every child who is not an idiot, and they are not idiots, <laughs> know that this apparent free choice secretly contains an even more, more stronger, much stronger order. It's not only you have to visit your grandmother, but you have to like it. So I'm beginning see, to like this book all the yeah, more. That's one example of how apparent tolerance, choice, and so on can conceal a much stronger, a much stronger order. Another so we should go back to more like the dad that just says, because I said so. Absolutely. It's more honest. We went to the McDonald's breakfast. This is not so ridiculous. Look what you get. Look, you have look what you get. Look, look, look. Just, look, look what you get. Look what you get. You know, you get this with happy meal. Yeah, to make you happy. Yeah, but this is for the kids. I go there to make him happy. He pretends to be happy there, not to disappoint me. <laughs> but what the hell? The game functions. No, this means that, again, you know, I love him, but my perspective is time, you know. Uh -huh. We go there, up and down, one hour passes. Uh -huh. No, no, it's pure desperate strategy of survival. Right. How to pass the time without getting too nervous, without... And this is easy, because he eats and sucks up for 20 minutes, how should I put it? What does he get nervous about? No, I get nervous! Get nervous. Okay, this will go, this will go. Yeah. He's perplexed, as you can see. <laughs> Zemo padali u temu filmu, u redu, ha? Kajde mi vidi, kajde mi vidi. No, he is narcissistically amused. It's just to keep him calm in a non-demanding state. So it's eating, it's this, it's whatever, no? Right. Or at least negotiating. Like yesterday he was building some Lego castles he wasn't satisfied with them, but then he gave me the role of just collecting a certain type of these small plastic cubes. I start to shoot at the animals, then I love this one, American Army. You know, this one, I bought it, I don't know where, but it's beautiful, you can open it, you see, and put soldiers in, so that then he attacks me from there. This was, he destroyed this castle that I had here. This is, this was his original, but the structure is very precise. It's incredible how you think it's chaotic, no? But he's the big wise guy. He observes. Here, it's, he's very pro-feminine. He wanted to have a, a woman as the boss, the queen. Then he said, but she would be alone. Why not have two girls? This is the two girls talking. You see, lesbian, progressive, politically correct, and so on, no? Uh, Two, le two, two lesbians and uh, but I like the and uh, I like this one. Isn't this a beautiful one? I bought it in Greece, a kind of a nice uh, old Roman. Uh, this I can do it at least traditionally in two lines, no? Mm -hmm. 
philosophy does not solve problems. The duty of philosophy is not to solve problems, but to redefine problems, to show how what we experience as a problem is a false problem. If what we experience as a problem is a true problem, then you don't need philosophy. For example, let's say that now there would be a deadly virus coming from outer and space, so not in any way mediated through our human history, and it would threaten all of us. We don't need basically philosophy there. We simply need good science desperately to find, we, we would desperately need good science to find the solution to stop this virus. We don't need philosophy there because the threat is a real threat directly. You cannot play philosophical tricks and say, no, this is not the, you know what I mean? It's simply our life would be in, or, okay, the more vulgar, even simpler science fiction scenario. It's kind of Armageddon or whatever, no deep impact, a big comet threatening to hit Earth. You don't need philosophy here. You need, I don't know, to be a little bit naive, I don't know, strong atomic bombs to explode, uh, maybe. Maybe, I think it's maybe too utopian, but you know what I mean? I mean, the threat is there, you see it. In such a situation, you don't need philosophy. I don't think that philosophers ever provided answers, but I think this was the greatness of philosophy. No, not in this common sense that the philosophers just ask us questions and so on. I mean, what is philosophy? Philosophy is not what some people think, some crazy exercise in absolute truth, and then you can adopt, you know, this skeptical attitude. We, true scientists, are dealing with actual, measurable, solvable problems. Philosophers just ask stupid metaphysical questions and so on, play with absolute truth, which we all know is inaccessible. No, I think philosophy is a very modest discipline. Philosophy asks a different question, the true philosophy. How does a philosopher approach the problem of freedom? It's not are we free or not? Is there God or not? It asks a simple question, which would be called a hermeneutic question. What does it mean to be free? So this is what philosophy basically does. It just asks when we use certain notions, when we do certain acts and so on and so on, what is the implicit horizon of understanding? It doesn't ask these stupid ideal questions, is there truth? No. The question is, what do you mean when you say this is true? So you can see, it's a very modest thing, philosophy. Philosophers are not the madmen who search for some eternal truth and so on and so on. You don't get into the spirit of the thing. It's all part of being a member. What we encounter here, I think, is precisely Lacan's reversal of the famous Dostoevsky motto, if God doesn't exist, everything is permitted. If God doesn't exist, everything is prohibited. How? On the one hand, again, uh, you are allowed to have a full life of happiness and pleasure, but in order precisely to be happy and so on, you should avoid dangerous excesses, so at the end, everything is prohibited. I mean, you cannot eat fat, you cannot have coffee, you cannot have nothing, precisely in order to enjoy it. So today's hedonism combines pleasure with constraint. It is no longer the old notion of the right measure between pleasure and constraint. Like sex, yes, but not too much, proper measure. No, it's something much more paradoxical. It's a kind of immediate coincidence of the two extremes. Like, it's as if action and reaction coincide. The very thing which causes damage should already be the counteragent, the medicine. The ultimate example I encountered in, recently in California, I don't know if you can buy it also here in New York, is a chocolate laxative. <laughs> and there it says, as a propaganda, do you have still constipation? Eat more of this chocolate. Like, no, the thing is already its own counteragent. And uh, the negative proof of the hegemony of this stance, I think, is the fact that today, the true unconstrained consumption in all its main forms, drugs, free sex, smoking, is emerging as the main danger.
the traditional notion of psychoanalysis is that because of some inner obstacles, you internalized, identified excessively, excessively with paternal or other social prohibitions, you cannot set yourself free to enjoy, to pleasure is not accessible for you. It is accessible to you only in pathological forms of feeling guilty and so on. So then the idea is psychoanalysis allows you to suspend, overcome these internalized prohibitions so that it enables you to enjoy. The problem today is that the commandment of the ruling ideology is enjoy in different ways. It can be sexual enjoyment, uh, uh, consumption, commodity enjoyment, up to spiritual enjoyment, realize yourself, whatever. And I think that the problem today is not how to get rid of your inhibitions and to be able to spontaneously enjoy. The problem is how to get rid of this injunction to enjoy. Organizations such as the New York Psychoanalytic Institute have helped gain general acceptance for theories considered radical when first advanced some 50 years ago by Dr. Sigmund Freud. The relationship between childhood frustrations and disturbed adult behavior has been clearly traced by such authorities as Dr. René Spitz of New York. Distressing experiences in childhood may set up patterns which in later life will produce mental conflicts. Such conflicts lead to the same feeling of insecurity which was felt as a child. When such conflicts paralyze the individual, preventing him from acting freely, he is said to have a neurosis. Let us see how a neurosis develops. My Eternal fear is that if for a brief moment I stopped talking, you know, the whole spectacular appearance would disintegrate, people would think there is nobody and nothing there. And this is my fear, as if I am nothing who pretends all the time to be somebody and has to be hyperactive all the time just to, just to, just to fascinate people enough so that they don't notice that there is nothing. When? Okay, you also, you also. Okay. One of the big reproaches to psychoanalysis is that it's only a theory of individual pathological disturbances and that applying psychoanalysis to other cultural or social phenomena is theoretically illegitimate. It asks in what way you as an individual have to relate to social field, not just in the sense of other people, but in the sense of the anonymous social as such, to exist as a person. You are, uh, under quotation marks, normal individual person, only being able to relate to some anonymous social field. What is to be interpreted and what not, is that everything is to be interpreted, that is to say, when Freud says, unbehagen in der Kultur, civilization and its discontent, more literally, the uneasiness in culture. He means that it's not just that most of us as normal, we socialize ourselves normally, some idiots didn't make it, they fall out, oh, they have to be normalized. Not culture as such, in order to establish itself as normal, what, what, what appears as normal, involves a whole series of pathological cuts, distortions, and so on and so on. There is, again, a kind of a, a, a unbehagen, uneasiness. We are out of joint, not at home, in culture as such, which means, again, that there is no normal culture. Culture as such has to be interpreted.
When people ask me, why do I combine Lacan with Marx? Well, my first answer is Lacan already did it. I think, for example, that it's only through the strict psychoanalytic Lacanian notion of fantasy that we can really grasp what Marx was aiming at with his notion of commodity fetishism. It's, I think, precisely the use of Lacanian notions like, again, fantasy, uh, fantasy in the strict Lacanian sense, or excess plus de jouir, excess enjoyment, and so on and so on, the real, not to mention the real, that we can understand today's phenomena like uh, new fundamentalist forms of racism, like the way our so-called permissive societies are functioning. Again, here, the psychoanalytic notion, especially the way it was conceptualized by Lacan, the psychoanalytic notion of superego as injunction to enjoy, as an obscene category, not as a properly ethical category, is of great help. So again, I think that if Freud, in his Freudian theory in its traditional configuration, was appropriate to explain the standard capitalism which relied to some kind of a more traditional ethic of sexual control, repression, and so on, then Lacan is perfect to explain the paradoxes of permissive late capitalism. When did you have the last meal? Breakfast or down there? Down there. So we should stop. So one, no, no, I mean one, two hours later we should maybe go down there and, uh, or do you know any, I mean, you know, at the place where you had your coffee, they do have good menus, you know, like very nice ones, like a simple steak or whatever. They are not bad, I mean. No, they're all vegetarian. Sorry? They're all vegetarian. Degenerates, degenerates. You will turn into monkeys. Yeah, there is a table free here if you want to be absolutely opportunist. Aqua congas. Yeah. Why shouldn't I all? Anyway, could you put it there? No, no, sorry, I mean, where to, to put show it? Martina? Yeah. No, yeah. Why do you want to, uh, why did you say it was a fundamental misunderstanding that so many people came? No, in the simple sense that I have this terribly feeling that they expect something which they will not get, and I wonder what. Many leftists expect the formula, you know. I will teach them what to do. Shit, right. what do I know? I mean, no. Some people expect... Do you feel like that's what that audience is looking for, specifically? No, it's a simple, common-sense insight. Wait a minute. 2,000 people, although I think they exaggerated, whatever, 1,000 people cannot all have the same interest in Lacan as I do, no? Right. You know, I, if you're, you know I, can, can I ask you a simple question? Right. If you were to have a daughter, would you allow this guy to take your daughter to cinema? Be honest, the answer is no. <laughs> I hate the way, the way I appear. In some documents, it's even worse. It's really as a kind of a criminal that I appear, you know. Do you think they were expecting just the sort of political advice or some sort of... You know, the problem is that whenever I talk about politics, I feel it as if it's a fake. No, not in the sense that I'm faking, that I don't mean it, but... My heart is not in it. The books that I really enjoyed writing was the one on Hegel, Tickley, sorry, on Schelling, Tickley's subject, and so on. And that part of the message doesn't get through. You can immediately see also in the way it, for example, the, of my last book, the one that I really loved, the opera Second Death. That one is doing very modestly, nothing, you know, that one is, but that's what I love.
No, we didn't yet, no? Okay. I'll tell you, wait a minute, first... Is this just drinks? No, 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 no. First, you should look here the menis. You have tallarines, filet milanesa, and salata Caesar. This is just for people who come to be shocked and hopefully to get out. This so is that the... is why you have it. You have it so that when people open the door, they go. Oh, yeah, they yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a small hope that yeah, yeah, that, that I will get rid of them. That's the only function. Has it ever worked? Yeah. Really? As a matter of fact, yeah. Some people were actually offended. My big worry is not to be ignored, but to be accepted. When I appear to be sarcastic and so on, the point is not not to take seriously. What is not to be taken seriously is the very form of sarcasm. It's the form of the joke which masks the fact that I'm serious. But people still have this idea that this guy did some big crimes and so on. No? Ah, of course, it's not as simple as that. I mean, that I'm simply a Stalinist. That would be crazy, tasteless and so on. But obviously, there is something in it that it's not simply a joke. When I say the only chance is that the left appropriates fascism and so on and so on. It's not a cheap joke. The point is to avoid the trap of the standard liberal oppositions, freedom versus totalitarian order, discipline and so on and so on. To rehabilitate notions of discipline, collective order, subordination, sacrifice, all that. I don't think this is inherently fascist. <laughs> Often friends tell me, but why do you provoke people unnecessarily? Why don't you simply say what you mean? That of course you are against fascism, but blah, blah, blah. I tell them, yes, this is good as an abstract, theoretical, not even theoretical, intellectual, whatever statement, but it doesn't work like that. For example, concerning Stalinism, my God, I've probably written more about Stalinism, about its most horrible aspects, than most of the people who reproach me with Stalinism. And that's my wager here, that sorry, the only way to get the message. If you say, of course I'm against fascism, there are just some uh, uh, attitudes which were traditional even more to the left, but fascism appropriated them, blah, blah, blah. I think it doesn't have the desired precise political effect. It enables the liberal consensus to reappropriate it. You must say it with this excess. Lufthansa socks. I stolen two of them today. I went to wash my hair, and then I was reading a big situation, and then the woman hairdresser noticed it and told me, why don't I give you a massage with some oil? I enjoyed it, but I felt so obscene, as if I paid for masturbation. It was so obscene. But it was relaxing, you know, it is nice. Really? But, but <laughs> it's too much. But my God, where are you? This reminds me of socialism, carrying water in plastic bottles. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Really? Yeah, because they were waiting for us. You see, we were yeah, not waiting. Yeah, I realize late. it because you're not here. No, but they wait they for us. You see, it's not that. Uh, yeah, they didn't start without you. <laughs> Okay, let's now start as soon as possible. Okay, let's go in and start as soon as possible. Okay. The majority of academics who are obsessed with this idea, the left needs a new answer. Isn't it basically, we want a radical revolution, but at the same time, we want our relatively prosperous lives to go on undisturbed. Like, precisely as already Robespierre said, we want a revolution without a revolution. There is, I notice, a fundamental difference between the standard plurality of struggles in which progressive liberals... What does it mean? Isn't it in a way false even to expect such a clear political formula in the sense of, oh, all we need is a bright intellectual to tell us the formula, what to do, and then capitalism will be over, we'll have socialism, and so on and so on. I'm stupid, I don't understand. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. In a way, I have to accept this, again, almost Lacanian decenterment of subjectivity, which is that I stand for something, but I don't really master, dominate what I stand for. People see things in me, they have some expectations. There may be political expectations that I will provide the formula, the big question that everybody is expecting today from a leftist intellectual, what should we do? Or some kind of spiritual guidance to help them, psychological or theoretical amusement in the sense of many dirty jokes or examples from movies. And I honestly accept that. I think that my reaction to this should be not so much Oh, it's all a big misunderstanding, they're missing my deep point, but my duty is basically to try and occupy the position of the analyst, which is basically to play in a way of transference with these expectations and to undermine, frustrate them. To make it clear to them that the question is not what I can give them, but are these expectations legitimate? What this expectation should tell them about themselves? It was usually that big progressive act was like it was Nixon, not Democrats, who had to do it with China and so on. This paradox, in the, it was in France, it was De Gaulle, not socialists, who got out of Algeria. Sorry? To Algeria, yes. So, indeed, but I'm a little bit <laughs> skeptical. You really are an intellectual superstar to me, so I had to cut you. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm collecting. I'm just opening this here. I'm ready to progress. Of? And progress, the journal of the College of the Studies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Harvard, you may know it. I brought your copy, which is a Perfect. Perfect. Oh, be serious. I'm just laughing. This is a shower. Uh, it was over there. Who knows here? The guy knows. I'm sorry. You know things here. You know. Okay, sorry. You know the guy who did the hero? The hero, the Chinese guy. Then, uh, uh, uh -huh. Double indemnity is not on the market now, I think, no? Uh -huh. Being there also, I think it looks bad, no? Being there, you know, Peter Sellers. Hall Ashby. Now, this is too intelligent for me. You know, the ape will not get the banana. But fuck it, I don't get it here. Ah, US 70s, being there. Ha, ha, ha. What is it? Being there. It's a wonderful movie. And look, my anal character, the price is okay. So definitely. Definitely. What more do I need? Fountainhead uh, is the best American movie of all times. Then the best uh, German movie would be Opfergang. This is uh, the sacrificial path. Of course, from 44 by White Harland, the Nazi director, no? So we have Ayn Rand, Nazi, and then, unfortunately, okay, this is a more standard one, no? It is Ivan the Terrible, Eisenstein. I would say these three are the best movies of all times for me. This one I wanted, yes, definitely. So we have these two. That will be it, I think. Hey, how about if I buy them for you? Sorry? No, wait a minute. Poor American girl, working class. 
Who pays for that? Do no, but are you sure you are you sure yeah, you are yeah, reimbursed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give okay, you with pleasure. I'll let with you pleasure. Back. Okay. Now let it be the eternal secret of my desire. Right. Did I suspect this in advance or not? You know, like if you I were not, if if if, if you if you were not to make this offer, I would in the last minute say, oh, maybe not now. I have too many things to care. Yeah, this one is a little expensive, actually. Thirty-two dollars. Shut up, or you will get three more. All right. I'm so sad that I... Ah, wait a minute, wait a minute, what is this? My God, I would love to have, so that you will not... Uh, let me buy is that this... a special booklet? Well, which one? Uh, uh, sorry, can I buy this one also? Oh, sorry, ha, 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 fuck off. <laughs> what are you working on now, Sloven? What are you doing? What's the new book? The mega, basically ticklish subject, part two. Big, big, mega thing. How far along are you? Uh, pretty close to the end. No, but it will be mega. Uh, one part uh, philosophy, theology. One part cognitivism. I'm now deep in brain sciences. And one part politics, obscenity, and so on. What's it going to be called? I don't yet know. Maybe the parallax view, but I must check it on Amazon.com simply, like, if there are already 20 books named right. the parallax view, no? I must look into that aspect. What does the parallax view mean? Uh, no, no, it means something very simply, which comes as close as possible to what my, what my position is. It's, you know that it's very simple, is that when you mistake an apparent move, you look at an object, it appears that the object itself moves or changes, but in reality it's just that because your perspective shifts, no? Like lunar, stellar, stellar uh, whatever, solar parallax. The idea is your shift in your subjective position is reified, you perceive it as move in the object. But of course, my, then I add another twist that what it is in the object in a way, no? Because object, subject are mediated and so on and so on. So what interest me is precisely this radical cut, like you move from one to another perspective, there is no way to overcome this, this antinomy, no? And then I develop this systematically in philosophy, cognitive science, like in cognitive sciences, the parallax would have been either you look at your inner experience or you open the skull, you see the stupid flesh, their brains, no? But you really cannot make the jump. And you really cannot, even if scientifically you can explain it, you cannot really accept it that that stupid piece of meat that you see, that's thought. So if we distilled your canon into like three books, what would they be? Uh, uh, three of my best books are unfortunately four, I would say, no? Yeah. Sublime Object, Tearing with the Negative, Tickly Subject, and now the new one. Yes, this is the serious work I've done, mm -hmm. with little pieces here and there. Mm -hmm. But this is what I would... Mm -hmm. Although I'm more and more self-critical of the first one, it's still too, too liberal. I'm for democracy there, I'm ashamed. I'm so very, very sorry to say. I think that there was a thing called totalitarianism, which was bad. And I think that there should be pluralism in society. My God, what am I talking there? I mean, you know that Marx Brothers joke, I would never be a member of a club that, I could, like, you know, if I were not myself, I would arrest myself. <laughs> I have a very complicated ritual about writing. It's psychologically impossible for me to sit down, so I have to trick myself. I elaborate a very simple strategy, which at least with me it works. I put down ideas, but I put them down usually already in a relatively elaborate way, like the line of thought already written, full sentences and so on. So up to a certain point, I'm telling myself, no, I'm not yet writing the book, I'm just putting down ideas. Then at a certain point, I tell myself, everything is already there, now I just have to edit it. So that's the idea, to split it into two. I put down notes, I edit it. Writing disappears. Oh, sorry.
Please, please. Let's be loud enough, please. Good question, but not in the sense that now I will say, oh, I'm more, they're so nice. No, it's a much more serious phenomenon. Let's be quite frank. At a certain superficial level, I'm relatively popular. But me and my friends, I don't think you can, maybe you can, even imagine how non-influential are we within the academia. Which is why it pisses me off how many, whoever they are, the enemies, uh, portray us Lacanians as some kind of a phallogocentric power discourse. It's very fashionable to paint us as kind of a dogmatic power discourse. For example, yesterday when I delivered a differently improvised version of the same talk at Columbia in New York, a lady kindly towards the end asked me, but why? Her problem was, why am I so dogmatically Lacanian? Mistreating that you are doing when there is a concern that you this is an yeah. to your work. And I wonder whether this is also another form of uh, whether a certain sort of belief operating uh, uh, from a distance in your work. What, in which belief? Dogmatic Lacanian thing working as a belief in your work. Perfect. Perfect. Student, yeah. Uh, Perfect question. Religion. Okay. I defy you with a very simple empirical in the best Anglo-Saxon tradition question. Apart from this brief conflict between Gayatri Spivak and Derrida, could you name me one Derridian who, no, who made a small critical remark on Derrida? Rodolphe Gachet, Abital Ronel, name Sam Weber, name me one. Why are we dogmatic? Why are they not? <laughs> name me one, name me one point where Sam Weber makes an ironic critical remark on Derrida. Name me one point where Avital Ronel does it. Name me one point where Rodolphe Gasset does it. So why, why are we, why is my attached, why am I dogmatically attached to Lacan? And it's not, why did you think this is disavowed belief? I am a Lacanian. I mean, you are knocking on the open door here. I mean, you know, you don't have to prove through some deconstructive analysis, oh, but he's a Lacanian. I am a card-carrying Lacanian. <laughs> you know, something is going on here, and I just wanted to draw the attention to this, how all this popular, and I think so, to give you now the true answer, I think that I admit it. I, there is a clownish aspect to me, like they put it in New York Times, Marx Brother or whatever, no? Uh, uh, all that, I maybe flirt with it. But nonetheless, I'm getting tired of it because I noticed that there is, as it were, when there are some stupid reports on me, reactions to me, a kind of a terrible urge, compulsion, to make me appear as a kind of a funny man, and so on and so on. And the true question would be, where does this urge come from? Why is there this necessity to portray me as somebody who can only thrive, thrive through jokes, and so on and so on and so on, and even my publishers buy it. You know that my Lenin book, Introduction of Language, was almost turned down by Verso? Why? First, they always, at Verso, gave hints at me, oh, you are just making jokes, and so on and so on. Then I told them, okay, now you have a book, Lenin's text, which you not. Their approach was, wait a minute, where are the jokes? Nobody will buy the book, and so on and so on. <laughs> so, you know, it's much more than it may appear is going on here. It's a quite a complex phenomenon. It's a quite a complex uh, phenomenon. I'm almost tempted to say that Making me popular is a resistance against taking me serious, how should I put it? And I think it's my duty for this reason to do a kind of a public suicide of myself as a popular comedian or whatever. <laughs>
go up, you jump down, and it's kind of a nice, modest, ethical suicide, you know. It's not this spectacle that on the street you embarrass other people. You go here and you jump down. Of course, my idea was to organize this. You want to kill yourself, we organize it, we prevent so that we guarantee that no small five dollars, no small children will be here. I even have the idea that, you know, the way they do it in this society of biopolitics, as Foucault would have put it, where they ask you, uh, in order to get married, you know, if you don't have age, you are mentally stable and so on. Obviously, it doesn't work because if it were to work, I would never be allowed to, to get married, no? But what do you say? That they should do, do it the same like if you want to kill yourself, no? I was thinking about it. I think that only people, some medical or psychiatric advisory committee team should decide is it a case of a true metaphysical suicide or just a short crisis, like you were dropped by your girlfriend or boyfriend and there is a reasonable hope there that it's a momentary depression that in two, three weeks will be open, no? So it can be medical crisis, it can be this kind of psychological crisis or pure metaphysical suicide. Marxist is, I may add, if somebody tells that Lacan is difficult, this is class propaganda by the enemy. Okay. I never thought I'd have this much fun talking about this. Thanks very much. Have a great weekend. Take care.